share my screen and hopefully can find the right slides. Um, so it sounds like, um, Matot, this is the first class, is that right, of the series or no? <laughs> yes. It, it is. Okay. I, I'm, I'm certainly, I would be curious to know, I haven't seen the whole agenda and um, we'll want to maybe come back and listen to what others have, have to present, have to say. But so I'm going to start by, by talking a, a little bit about this idea of biophilia. So um, as the intro suggests, I'm, I'm, um, I teach in an urban planning department in a school of architecture, uh, tra trained as an ur urban planner, th thinking a lot about uh, cities. Um, and a lot of my own work has been around sustainability in cities, resilient cities, and increasingly we recognize the, the need really for cities to, to uh, rise to the occasions. We, you know, we're facing some pretty daunting challenges when you think about climate change and how uh, cities are going to have to already adapt pretty quickly at the same time. Uh, working to, to rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, and the, on the mitigation side. Uh, to do all those things really requires, we believe, uh, compact and, and dense uh, uh, cities. If we're going to design uh, walkable cities, cities where we invest in transit, uh, they've got to be compact and dense. Uh, so it raises a question, can you in fact have density and compactness, but also have that connection with nature? And we believe yes. Uh, so there's a question mark on this slide, take that question mark away. We very much are going to argue tonight that you can have those things. You, you must in fact have the density, compactness, and nature. So it builds uh, uh, importantly on this idea of biophilia. And I, I, I'm hoping that's a term that you've uh, heard before. Um, here is one definition from E.O. Wilson. It's essentially the idea that we have this innate uh, connection to, to nature, this innate affiliation that we've co-evolved with the natural world and to be uh, a truly happy and healthy and to lead meaningful lives, we, we need nature. Um, it's not something optional. It's absolutely essential uh, and, and it has to be all around us where we live and work, where we're spending most of our uh, our time. It can't just be something that we get on a holiday a couple of times a year. So that's the key uh, idea. Um, E.O. Wilson wasn't the first person to, to use the word biophilia, but he's really the one who's coined it in, in this way. So around 2010 or so, we started this thing called the Biophilic Cities Project. Uh, at UVA, which later uh, led to this Biophilic Cities Network. And this is something Carl has been involved in from the very beginning. So she, she has been one of our sort of a, a inaugural leaders and staff for this network and continues to work on it. And maybe she'll tell you more about that. Um, I'm not gonna go through a lot of the evidence because I think Carl is gonna talk about this in great detail. I'll only just say, that this uh, idea that we connect with nature, that we're, we, we have this innate uh, a draw, this innate affiliation to nature, I think for me, it is demonstrated on a daily basis or an hourly basis, if you will. When you think about the things that you're drawn to, the things that make us happy, that give us delight, they are these kinds of things. They are flowers and trees and butterflies and, and water and the sounds of, of things like water and, and birds. I'm gonna talk uh, quite a bit later on about, about birds. And there is this growing body of evidence. Um, almost weekly, it seems, there is a new study. This is one, uh, Carla may, may talk about this in greater depth, but a, a study in bioscience showing the relationship between uh, the presence of nature and, and reported uh, levels, lower levels of depression, anxiety, and, and stress. And, and uh, all of this evidence around uh, forest bathing and showing that at the end of a walk through, through a, a forest, our stress hormone levels go down and our, we get a boost to our immune system and we feel better, our, our mood is more positive, our cognitive functioning is, is, is greater. And, and it's connected, we believe, to this idea of biophilia. Um, and so we don't know exactly what's going on uh, there is an emerging science uh, here. Uh, the image on the right is all about the idea of fractals. These are um, shapes and forms in nature, these self-repeating uh, shapes in, in nature, the idea that a leaf is a small version of a bow, which is a small version of the larger tree. 
Um, and the argument uh, is a quote from Richard Taylor, we've gotten to know, who's the chair of the physics department at the University of Oregon, who's done all this wonderful work on fractals, uh, that we've evolved a visual system to, to effort, effortlessly process um, those fractals, those natural shapes. And the image on the left, a uh, really innovative um, project from the UK where they're using bird song to detect hearing loss. Um, all to remind me to just make the pitch and I'll maybe circle back to this when I talk about birds, but uh, bird song is something we know the evidence is, is growing that it, it really does have this positive effect um, on us and for us. So all these things that Carl is gonna talk about I think in greater detail, um, it, it is a huge task uh, to try to summarize the, the literature. Um, all of those things on the right are, in fact, connected in one way or another to the presence of, of, of nature. And, and Carla and I are, are frequently talking about this in terms of the word flourishing, which is a wonderful word that, that captures the, the, the qualities of nature, the, the things that nature delivers, that it's not just the pleasure and the delight, it's its purpose and, and meeting and, and connection, and all these uh, things that make life really wonderful. So um, we want cities that are natureful. And, and that's the, the main argument that I'm making here, we're making that, that cities, the future of cities is a natureful one. It is a biophilic one and it has to be, it needs to be. And we have all of these challenges that cities are facing. This is an image, by the way, from, from Rotterdam. Uh, we like to say that a natureful city, a biophilic city, anything that makes a city uh, more biophilic will also make it more resilient. So in Rotterdam, much of that challenge has to do with water. So they are investing, for example, in, in uh, installation of green rooftops or uh, um, the image from second from the left, the, the idea of a, of a water plaza, water square um, that in, it provides more a space for a city, more gathering space for neighborhoods, but at the same time designed to collect and retain uh, stormwater. So there is this emerging movement around biophilic design. Um, much of that is focused at the building scale. It's quite exciting um, and it's been largely driven by the architectural world. Um, this is a new building in Toronto um, and uh, uh, Brian Brisbane, an architect that we've gotten to know. And uh, this is a, essentially a vertical, a forested vertical tower. Um, and a lot of uh, wonderful examples of biophilic buildings that are bringing nature into the center. Uh, and, and in this case, creating wonderful, a wonderful living environment for people in this tower, but also creating a kind of uh, vertical park uh, for uh, the residents who live in this neighborhood. So um, we have wonderful case studies of buildings, of biophilic buildings. This is another one uh, from Pittsburgh the Phipps Conservatory's Center for Sustainable Landscapes. By the way, um, along the way, uh, one of the things that we've been doing is, is making short documentary films about a, a number of exemplary biophilic projects. And so we have a new film, five or six minute film uh, about the, this building. And I'd love for you to take a look at that. And um, Carla and I will probably mention this webpage multiple times, but do take a look at biophiliccities.org. That's our main page for Biophilic Cities uh, and for the network. And there is a film page that, that has um, all of these films and a number of them that I'm gonna mention here along the way. Um, so we believe though a Biophilic City, this vision of Biophilic Cities is, is more than simply a city that has lots of biophilic buildings. Um, that's really important. And, and we know we spend a lot of time inside, right? So, so bringing that nature into the, into the center, into the interior spaces of where we live and work is really important. But we believe biophilic cities is much more than that. It's uh, uh, everything from room or rooftop all the way out to region or bioregion and all of those spaces in between. And it is a city that facilitates the connect, connection to nature and to each other. It's also a city that understands it has a role, an important role to play in addressing global conservation. So one of our one of the key attributes of a, of a future city for us is one that shares space with other species. It's a multi-species uh, city, a biodiverse uh, a city. Um, and as a result of that, it's also a city that cares about 
uh, that nature and, and works to coexist with many other forms uh, of life. So there's an ethical uh, dimension to this uh, as well. So this uh, vision is a holistic vision of a natureful city. This is an image uh, uh, of a building in, uh, in Singapore. Singapore is one of our uh, original partner cities in the Biofolk Cities uh, network. And it's a city that has called itself a garden city uh, for many, many years. And recently they've shifted their language and, and, and for a while calling themselves a city in a garden, uh, which captures sort of the essence of our vision, which is that you don't just want to imagine cities where there are places of nature, parks and, and designated spots that you visit but rather we wanna see the whole city as, as a natural system, as an ecosystem, which it is. Um, and increasingly in, in Singapore, they, they are now describing themselves as a city in nature um, and, and even a biophilic city in nature, which maybe seems a, little, seems a little bit redundant, but we kind of like that redundancy. And adopting uh, and implementing a whole host of, of planning uh, policies to to uh, implement this vision, including something called the landscape replacement policy. So this buildings like this one uh, more than replace the, the nature lost from the footprint of the building, the ground level nature with, with vertical nature. So this is uh, sky parks and green uh, rooftops and green walls and, and uh, flowing nature, you know, uh, you see here. Um, this is a Wohad design. Wohad is an architectural firm based in Singapore that we've gotten to know and we love their, love their work. So um, if I had a little more time, uh, um, we, we could have a, an hour or two conversation about what uh, constitutes uh, a biophilic city. These are, are some of the main uh, sort of themes, an immersive nature. We want a city where we are immersed in nature, where the nature is integrated, continuous, and, and seamless. And it is about connecting uh, the built and natural environments together, right? So a lot of this is human designed uh, nature, uh, that green roof or that green wall. It's biodiverse and multi-species. It's whole of city, again, rooftop to region or bioregion and all of the, the uh, levels in between. It is whole of life. So uh, uh, someone uh, growing up in a biophilic city is exposed to nature at a very early age and, and enjoys that nature uh, all the way through to, uh, to um, the, the, the senior years of one's life. It's a just and inclusive city, and it's a, a, a city that, that um, facilitates a culture of, of biophilia. Just another uh, slide to make the same point that uh, this is an integrated, multi-scale uh, vision of, of nature in the city. We sometimes talk about this as a, a whole of city approach. This is Hels uh, 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 an image of Helsinki on the left by the way, where, where you have this wonderful integrated uh, green space network and it's possible to move from a dense downtown and, and, and move all the way, walk all the way to, to old growth forests at the edge of that, that town. We, we frequently talk about this vision as a matrix of urban nature. So there, there's a continuum, of course, from indoors to outdoors. We certainly do want to bring nature inside. We also want to do what we can to overcome the barriers between indoor and outdoor nature. Um, but a lot of our agenda is more kind of on the right side of, of this slide. And moving from, again, seeing a city as a place where there are discrete pieces of nature to a, a system and an ecosystem of, of, of nature. Um, let's see. So um, we, we frequently, you know, talk about nature spaces. There are so many places, really, um, every, every space in a city where you could grow something is a place where there is the possibility for nature. And our cities and our network show a, a real continuum, a real range from a tiny nature, nature in a living alley, or nature in the form of a sidewalk garden, all the way out to the larger uh, regional networks of, of open space. Um, we believe that a biophilic city is also one that emphasizes uh, awe, awe and wonder. In fact, I'm frequently defining a good city or a, a, a biophilic city as a place that, that uh, maximizes moments of awe. So uh, these are images, actually, images from another film. Uh, there's a wonderful um, New York nonprofit called Gotham Whale. 
And I'd love for you to watch this film as well. It's about the return of humpback whales to the waters of, of New York. But uh, what a way to define a good city, a place where you might catch a glimpse of a whale. Uh, or a dolphin as you're riding to work on a ferry or, or something you might see from your balcony. Um, and so there are so many uh, possibilities for experiencing awe in a, in a natureful city and it can be a very meaningful part of our lives. Um, again, we believe that this vision of future cities has to make room for many other forms of life. Um, these are images from Kura Debat, um, another one of our partner cities in Costa Rica, um, where they are, they have a sweet city program and they're doing wonderful things to plant native species of, of plants and pollinators, um, uh, pollinator gardens uh, all throughout the city and creating these bio corridors. And the image on the left is a recent Guardian a story um, that talks about the mayor, the original mayor who sort of envisioned the sweet city uh, program likes to talk about giving citizenship to, to bees and plants and trees and, and, um, and birds. So we have wonderful stories of our cities that are working to coexist uh, with nature. Back to Singapore, many of you probably know the story of the smooth coated otters in Singapore. There are now more than 80 of them and I think 12 different families. Uh, they've, they've returned to this very dense, heavily developed uh, city state. Um, and they are beloved. It's not, uh, uh, not without some conflict, um, but I think everyone realizes, or most residents realize that their lives are enhanced by having the possibility of seeing a, a, an otter during one's day. Um, and, and it's also a lesson in, in how you, you uh, create more biodiverse uh, cities because the image on the left is the Kalang River actually and the Bishan Park. Uh, which has been converted from a, a storm channel, essentially an engineered storm uh, channel into a natural meandering biodiverse river. And it's actually uh, thought that this uh, restoration project is a lot of the reason why the, the otters have, have returned. So we have another film <laughs> about the otters, I think seven or eight minute film on our uh, webpage as well. Uh, do take a look at that. Edmonton, Canada is another one of our partner cities. Uh, wonderful uh, planning uh, story there. They have uh, emphasized e ecological connectivity in their, in their plans. This idea of uh, everything that they do in this, in this city uh, being evaluated by uh, the ease with which an animal can, can move through the city. So they've now uh, built their 27th wildlife uh, passage through the city for every sized uh, animal you can imagine. Um, we talk a lot about wildness and the importance of wildness in, in cities and future cities have to be wild. And I think that's one of the stories behind the pandemic. And it's certainly actually one of the stories um, behind what we're finding in places like Singapore. Singapore went through a really interesting period, an unexpected uh, lockdown um, in, in which the the normal, uh, I'm telling you a story that doesn't relate very well to this particular slide, but um, all the normal sort of cutting of the grass, the maintaining of the landscapes, landscaping couldn't, couldn't be done. And a lot of it is done by in parks, the National Parks Board. Um, and what happened was that residents saw the city in a different way. And they actually come to realize that maybe they like the wilder um, result and they they and they certainly like the birds and butterflies and other critters that seem to be uh, more present in those wild uh, uh, spaces. So everything and anything we can do to rewild cities um, is a really important part of our vision. So here is a yet another film for you to watch. But this is Perth, Western Australia. Wonderful story uh, of uh, the conversion of what was a sterile. Um, water feature in the, in the middle of Perth, sterile, uh, energy intensive, chlorinated, um, you know, n n nothing living in it to what is today a, a remarkable native biodiversity, biodiverse wetland. Anyway, it's a wonderful story. That rewilding can happen in lots of different ways. Victoria Gastez, the capital of ba the Basque country in Spain, has been a partner city from the beginning. Um, this is a wonderful um, stream 
a daylighting project that's bringing nature into the center of their city. So this was a, actually a small river uh, uh, that was in a pipe under, underground and they brought it back to the surface and it's become a very popular gathering space. Okay, I'm quickly running out of time. I'm gonna shoot for um, ending in about 10 minutes and, uh, and then I'll uh, shift, I'll, we'll shift over to Carla. So one of the, um, one part of the vision, a really important part of our vision is uh, what we sometimes call just biophilia, a recognition that especially in American cities, there has been an unfair distribution of, of nature and that we have this, we have systemic racism, we have segregated uh, land use policies and, and, and patterns. Uh, that means that in, in cities like Richmond, Virginia, which you see here, even though there's a wonderful wild river, not every person in every neighborhood gets to enjoy it in the same way. And, and especially neighborhoods of color uh, uh, often don't have the same uh, access. And, and it's true as well for, for trees and tree canopy. And we know that tree canopy cover follows pretty closely the, the redlining maps. So the, those areas of the city that haven't gotten the same investment have been discriminated against are also the places where you have lower levels of tree, tree canopy and they're the hotter, hottest places too. They're high on, on the heat vulnerability index. So the image on the left actually is the draft, uh, new draft comprehensive plan for the city of Richmond. Richmond is now in our network and they are taking this on and they have established minimum tree canopy targets for all neighborhoods and they are emphasizing uh, investments in, neighbor, in neighborhoods that, that need it the most and, and especially neighborhoods of color. Um, and LeVar Stoney actually, the current mayor has made this a priority. And in fact, this, this, these are images actually from the fall and he's created uh, five new parks in the city to, to address uh, this unjust uh, circumstance. So, um, Pittsburgh is also uh, in our network, and this is an image just to sort of show you uh, the ways in which we can think about nature in a, in a heavily built uh, a city. And it is those uh, human design things. It's also, it's water, it's, it's, it is parks, it's trails, um, it's birds, it's looking at that bridge and the other, th other kind of built um, um, aspects of the city and recognizing that there is, there is nature there um, as well. So in 2013, uh, we officially started this network of cities and we had these 10 um, initial cities. We now have 25 uh, uh, cities. Um, Toronto is uh, the last official city to join as a partner city. Actually, Lima is, is uh, we think, soon going to join uh, as, as well. And there are probably a hundred other uh, cities we've been in conversations with. There uh, is a protocol for joining and uh, all of that is on the webpage if you have an interest in that. We're heavily North American and, and European as you can sort of tell uh, in this map, but we uh, are, are hoping to have uh, cities in the network around from around the world, especially uh, Africa. And, and uh, uh, we have one city in, in, in Australia, we're hoping for more. Uh, cities and Chinese cities as well. So it will be a, hopefully a truly global uh, network and it is definitely gaining uh, uh, in traction and this, uh, this vision is gaining traction. Um, usually I show up uh, when a city joins and, and deliver the, the certificate. Um, this is Mayor Peduto, the, the mayor of Pittsburgh who's been a, a big supporter of the network and there is often a, a celebratory event. We had a, a wonderful event at the Phipps Conservatory in, in Pittsburgh and there's often, we often get very good press um, when this happens as well. So can tell you more about the cities. I'm running out of time. I've got about five minutes left, but again, there's a, a lot of information on the webpage. Um, this is just a little quick snapshot of what some of the cities are up to. The, the, the way they each see themselves, the, the way they envision uh, themselves is different from city to city, of course, and it, the opportunities to uh, conserve, protect, celebrate. Uh, nature will vary from, from city to city and climates are different. The ecology is, is different, but 
what uh, ties them together is this, um, this key commitment to putting nature uh, at, at the center. So um, there are metrics. Um, we, we think, we believe that a, you know, a biophilic city is not just a city that is natureful, not just defined by the presence or absence of nature, but, but rather by the various ways that residents uh, uh, interact with that nature, right? So it's how, how much do they care about that nature? How engaged with that nature uh, are they? And uh, uh, the ways that a local government relates to that nature, how much are they investing in, in nature? So um, there are metrics on the webpage and uh, happy to, to circle back to this and talk in, in more detail. So the last thing in my remaining four minutes is to uh, basically make a small pitch for uh, a, a particular version maybe of a biophilic city, which is this concept of a bird friendly city. And um, this is my newest book on the right. It just came out in the fall and, um, and I had a good story in uh, Fast Company um, in February uh, about it. And uh, it, it, it uh, basically argues that every city can and should be bird friendly and what we do to design cities um, that are good for birds will also make them um, good for humans, right? And the pandemic, I won't go into these slides, but I think for a lot of us, nature has been a saving grace. It's been a balm. It's been uh, something, a steadying uh, force in our lives at a time of turmoil. Uh, um, and a lot of people have discovered birds and are watching birds and are listening to bird song. We're literally hatching a new generation of bird lovers and bird enthusiasts. And uh, the evidence that to me is pretty compelling. And uh, it's everything from the amount of money that we're spending on bird seed uh, to downloads of bird identification guides. It, you know, we. And just anecdotally, so many people have told me how important birds uh, are. So um, there's a whole story about how uh, cities can be profoundly more bird uh, friendly. And it means thinking about design and planning through the perspective of a bird. Um, these are images back to Edmonton where they're using circuit theory uh, to, to do land use planning. So this is basically ele electrical circuit theory circuitscape modeling to see uh, where there are blockages and, and where there are points where a chickadee would not be able to move around and through uh, the city. And um, I have been a big fan, a big advocate for designing everything that makes space for other forms of life and, and birds especially. So this is a story from the book, um, a chimney and a reconstructed uh, a chimney in London where they designed in 54 uh, nesting spaces for common uh, swifts. And it's part of a sort of larger idea of designing everything. Um, and and it's, it's native plant gardens and it's uh, bird friendly uh, windows, a lot of things that we need to do, um, but we're moving in the direction of, of reimagining buildings and building facades and I love um, uh, Joyce Wong's uh, wonderful work around habitatures so kind of rethinking building facades as, as multiple habitats, habitats for multiple species. So I've got about a minute left and I'm going to stop. Um, but there are a lot of elements that, that go into making a bird friendly city. So my last slides are just to, to sort of wrap up the Biophilic Cities Network. Do take a look at the page, the web page. Uh, we do many things. We uh, we have monthly partner uh, city calls with our partner cities. We organize uh, events. Uh, we have an online journal, which you see here. All of the issues of this journal are on the webpage to see. It's a remarkable collection of, of uh, good practice and stories and, and inspiration, uh, inspiration that, inspirational stories of, of what cities are doing. All of these films, uh, this is a, an image from a 45 minute film that we did about about Singapore. It's also on the web page. Um, we do work with our partner cities. This is a, a neighborhood, a, a biophilic neighborhood design workshop that we did in Pittsburgh in February, just before the pandemic happened. Uh, our cities are doing many things um, together. And uh, this is one image from San Francisco. They're hosting a, 
delegation from Singapore, uh, two, two partner cities, um, and, and actually Singapore wanting to learn about San Francisco's uh, bird, bird safe design uh, standards, the first American city actually to adopt mandatory bird safe design standards. So this is my last slide. I think there are a lot of resources. Um, we have books, uh, we have full length uh, films. Um, this is another very recent book, the Handbook of Biophilic City Planning and Design. And actually Carla had a, a big role in, in helping uh, on that book. And it's just recently been uh, translated into Chinese. So there is the web page. Hooray. Okay. That was all very fast. Um, so we'll, Carla and I will, at the end of Carla's presentation, hopefully there'll be time for questions and, and discussion and, and maybe some of the some of the things I've showed you have maybe stimulated you to, um, or will stimulate you to ask some questions or make some comments. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing, Carla, and let you take over. And you've got a very biophilic building um, in your uh, your filter or in your room. Um... Do you recognize it? Uh, I don't know that I do. Where, is it Singapore? It's the Singapore airport, our last uh, oh, okay. biophilic city. You know, I was looking ever. at it and I was thinking it was from the outside. I was thinking it was an exterior shot. Yeah, yeah, I see now. Um, terrific. Okay, can you, do you see my, I can't really see what you're seeing now. Do you see my slides? We do, well, I do. Terrific, well, I'm uh, Carla Jones Harrell and I've um, been working with Tim now on Biophilic Cities since uh, pretty much the beginning of the project. Uh, and I learn something new every time I hear him uh, present. So there's so much, growth in this area, um, and it's, it's really exciting. Uh, I um, have a background in public health, health policy, and urban planning, so I'm going to expand on Tim's presentation um, by discussing how we might use theory and practice of bioflex cities to improve public health for the future. I'm gonna begin by discussing the importance of cities for health to describe how urban nature benefits uh, mental health, physical health, and overall well-being. Summarize how we may use urban nature as a tool for public health protection and promotion, um, specifically through a case study of the COVID-19 pandemic that we all are um, well aware of. Provide some questions that Tim and I have been thinking about, and then also invite you to post some questions. Um, and finally, we, um, I have a few additional resources as well. So I want to begin by starting to that health is produced at a variety of scales. It's important for us to consider all of the scales that produ produce health from global ecosystems to our individual behaviors and genetics. And it's all of these scales that interact to provide opportunities for health to flourish or um, provide environments um, that are detrimental to public health. You can see here um, that urban planning uh, has, has a role in many of these. So while urban environments can provide access to many amenities, including health services, urban life can also lead to many undesirable health effects um, highly urban, nature-deprived environments exact a psychological toll on well-being. The major environmental triggers for physical and mental illnesses are also highly associated with urban environments, including exposures to extreme temperatures, especially heat that Tim mentioned, chemicals, noise, and pollution. Because environmental stressors tend to be more prevalent in urban environments, city uh, residents are obviously more exposed to them. Um, Long-term stress exposure often depletes adaptive reserves and breaks down physiological processes, which ultimately leads to a higher susceptibility of uh, disease. So in urban environments, um, without time for rest, the body is constantly pressured by negative environmental stressors that are wearing on the immune system and leads to many negative um, health effects. In the literature, this has been often called the urban health pen penalty model. Uh, many studies have examined this issue, uh, such as a study in the Netherlands that um, looked at the relationship between the prevalence of psychiatric disorders and various levels of urbanization and found that the prevalence of psychiatric disorders increased as urbanization increased. 
The paper entitled Health and Well-Being in a Changing Urban Environment, which is listed here, um, it, uh, you can see that the components of the, the system shows different stages of, um, of development within cities and some health issues that are characteristically associated with that. And I think this provides a really nice framework for thinking through um, how our environments influence public health. So you can see here with the diagram that's on the right, um, different components of these systems, um, including food systems, infrastructure, access to resources. And I would argue that these um, are all within the role of an urban planner and sort of what we um, may be thinking about as we're um, creating plans, policies, and programs. So where does urban nature fit in? So maintaining and promoting public health depends on the health of other human beings, as we've seen now with infectious diseases, but also with the health of other ecosystems that we're in. So studies in various fields have examined the restorative effects of nature on human health, and given the negative toll that many urban environments can have on health, examining how urban nature um, is associated with health behaviors and outcomes um, to, to promote health and understanding what levels of exposure to nature are, are meaningful is really significant. Uh, quantitative measures such as heart rate, blood pressure, brain electrical activity, and skin conductance have been widely used and have demonstrated the positive effects of nature. So in the um, handbook of biophilic cities and design that Tim mentioned, uh, he proposed this model for proposed pathways of influence from urban nature to improved human health. For example, um, you could follow one pathway of urban nature leading to increased walking and physical activity, um, which leads to reduced to stress reduction, which then leads to positive health outcomes. Research has supported another pathway mentioned here, um, such as those that are engaging in exercise while in natural environments. It's called green exercise. I've demonstrated a significant difference in positive self-reported emotion. Um, and researchers argue that these benefits primarily result from an individual's feeling of connection to nature through um, experience, where connection to nature is a causal mechanism for the generation of psychological benefits because of the power of feelings associated with belonging to a community or something greater than oneself. High quality urban nature is also associated with many physical health benefits, including um, reduced air pollution through tree planting and um, other plantings, decreased uh, temperatures that offset the urban heat island effect that Tim talked about. Uh, greater tree canopies have been found to be associated um, with preventing skin cancer with shade. Um, the benefits of urban nature have been associated with cardiovascular health, di um, improved outcomes with diabetes and other chronic health conditions and um, associated with reduced mortality, um, those that have greater access to nature. Studies by Barton and Pretty and others have demonstrated that exercise um, in natural environments um, is associated with increased duration and intensity of physical activity when compared to exercise in indoor environments. And lastly, um, natural features in cities have often been perceived to be less safe, uh, but research has actually shown many associations of urban nature um, with reduced crime. This protection uh, and crime can improve the likelihood of residents actually getting out and exploring natural areas. Uh, uh, we often talk about in biophilic cities about um, dark skies and the importance of lighting um, so that we can connect with uh, the, the sky above us. And um, the argument for often using uh, brighter, uh, more harmful lights um, is for safety, but actually we have a colleague who's shown that that's, that's, not, uh, that's not the case. Studies um, have also shown that urban nature has vast benefits for mental health, particularly anxiety, depression, and uh, reducing stress. So one study found that a 1% increase in the proportion of usable or total green space resort resulted in a 4% lower rate of anxiety and mood disorder treatment. Um, it's also shown that higher amounts of green space within a, um, one kilometer or about 0.6 of a mile distance resulted in 
um, 25% lowered risk of anxiety disorders in the overall population. And there was an even stronger association found among children and people with lower socioeconomic status. A study in the UK found that individuals who lived in areas with the highest amount of green space had lower levels of cortisol and their self-reported feelings of stress were lower than those who spent more time in urban settings without uh, green space. Research conducted by Bayer et al. found that higher tree canopy coverage was strongly associated with lower levels of symptoms for depression, anxiety, and stress. Not only that, but uh, appropriately placed green spaces can also reduce noise levels that are often um, associated with stress in urban environments. So Tim discussed this idea of flourishing, um, which is what we wanna move toward. Uh, so thinking about well-being, higher biodiversity has been linked with various uh, measures of psychological well-being. We also know that nature has been associated with increased social cohesion. Um, which social cohesion is linked with various physical and psychological health benefits. Um, the presence of urban green spaces can encourage positive social interactions that cultivate the social cohesion in ways that enhance uh, health. So research um, has shown that the relationship between nature and health suggests that social cohesion is influenced by the presence and quality of urban green spaces like parks and forests, uh, a, root, a review found that um, social cohesion and increased social contacts were a major pathway through which the natural environment um, supports health, which is uh, what was in the model that we looked at earlier. So there are lots of ways that when we're interacting with nature, we're also able to interact with each other um, and promote social capital and uh, social cohesion. Another study among visitors to neighborhood parks in New Orleans noticed that participation in park organizations led to stronger perceptions of social cohesion and how the, this uh, higher level of social cohesion can actually go on to facilitate participation in clubs and organizations within the community. And lastly, Tim touched on just biophilia. Uh, green gentrification is a term that was coined to describe what happens when areas that enhance a lot of their natural features leads to the displacement of uh, disadvantaged populations. Research has uh, shown the need to be just green enough or to really put in some safeguards to keep green space um, equitable. A study uh, found that low income neighborhoods with large amounts of green space have cardiovascular mortality rates similar to those of wealthy neighborhoods. So, so urban nature can really provide a protective effect where oftentimes um, a lot of these SES characteristics are, are associated with um, negative health outcomes. So two other studies found that higher tree density in urban areas is associated with a decreased risk of childhood obesity, as well as depression and type two dia diabetes among low income families. In some, um, nature has many benefits for human health and well-being and also provides many of the ecosystem services that Tim uh, mentioned. So it's really a win-win um, for all. So I want to talk a little bit about infectious diseases since a lot of what we've been talking about um, are kind of chronic conditions. The 21st century um, has so far seen SARS starting in 2003, the avian flu, swine flu, uh, MERS, Ebola, and now COVID-19. Um, some have speculated that we are entering an era of uh, pandemics. So how might we design the cities of the future, cities of tomorrow to be safer, more habitable, more enjoyable places um, to, to live? Demographic shifts in the past century have really escalated the difficulty in containing a pandemic and the rise of globalization and urbanization have facilitated the rapid spread of viruses. We at uh, Biophilic Cities have been collecting news articles and research on how cities are really encouraging uh, connecting with nature during the pandemic. So let's dive a bit deeper um, into how the value of nature um, is, is, is being used during this time. And um, we have a webpage that I'll put in the chat if you're interested in checking out more of those articles. 
So how might we use nature as an intervention for physical health, mental health, and well-being during the pandemic? So research has shown that very fine particulate matter could carry the COVID-19 virus um, particles further. So diesel um, could be contributing to the spread as diesel exhaust has been shown to carry other viruses. Um, a study at the Harvard School of Public Health found that an increase in one microgram per cubic meter of air in long-term exposure to PM 2.5 was associated with an 8% increase in the COVID-19 um, mortality rate. Air pollution could either make people more susceptible uh, to COVID-19 infection or could actually be the vehicle that the virus uses to get into the lungs. Um, but you can see how biophilic um, strategies can help uh, reduce air pollution, as I mentioned earlier, and potentially help with um, future infectious disease uh, spreads. We've also seen um, that with the lockdowns in many cities across the globe, one of the permitted activities has been outdoor physical activity. Research at the University of Vermont found that outdoor activities um, that have been seeing the largest increases often have to do with nature. So it includes watching wildlife, which has been up 64%, gardening up 57%, taking photos or doing other um, art in nature. And of course, um, as I think many of us have been doing is spending more time um, walking through our neighborhoods, which is 70, uh, up 70%. Disruptions in the distribution chains have also led many to re-engage with gardening. So we've seen growths in urban agriculture as well. While we have seen increases in um, drug overdoses and other diseases of despair during the pandemic, many people have been um, trying to turn to nature as a coping mechanism to reduce stress. Research commissioned by the Mental Health Foundation in the UK has found that nearly 50% of respondents felt that spending time in green spaces has helped them cope with rising pandemic-related anxiety. And lastly, some cities have been experimenting with creating hubs of resources, making them more accessible um, by active transport. So even prior to the pandemic, there was this idea of the 20 minute, uh, 20 minute neighborhoods um, that have caught on around the world in cities like Melbourne and Paris, which relies on this concept of being able to get your basic needs within a 20 minute bike ride or walk and thinking about how we might be able to make many of those um, amenities outdoor based outdoors. So cities have been facing these public health challenges prior to the 21st century. Um, before the advent of germ theory in the 1880s, medical explanations for epidemics like cholera and yellow fever centered around the idea that miasma or poisonous gases in the air led to disease. But physicians then believed that vegetation, particularly tree canopies, could keep miasma and the associated diseases from spreading. Early American park designers, public health officials, and physicians therefore advocated for the creation of parks and planting of trees as public health measures. Uh, some landscape architects like Frederick Law Olmsted argued, um, unfortunately, uh, largely unsuccessfully, that urban parks and trees should be distributed evenly so that everyone would have easy access to nature. Although uh, the physicians and designers were wrong about the causes of these infectious diseases, their plans to build parks and plant trees were correct in so many ways, not the least because of their various uh, health benefits. So COVID-19 is showing us again that urban nature is a vital component of a comprehensive response to pandemics and disease. Access um, to nature is life-sustaining infrastructure and should be provided equally. Yet when we have a comparison uh, between the 2019 coronavirus pandemic, 2019-2020 into 2021, uh, then, and the 1918 influenza pandemic, we're seeing that the most widely available tools have remained nearly the same. Public health interventions have been and are still the first line of defense against a pandemic in the absence of a vaccine, such as social distancing. Um, understanding though, that the environment plays a significant role in disease dynamics and in determining the health of individuals has always been an essential aspect to controlling and managing infectious diseases and will only, only gain um, more traction. 
Meredith's professor of history at Yale University, uh, Dr. Frank M. Snowden, stated in an interview with the New Yorker that, quote, epidemics reflect our relationships with the environment, the built environment that we create and the natural environment that responds. So how might we use nature in cities to prevent disease and encourage flourishing? A few ideas, and I'm sure you all have more, are one, better integrate public health, urban planning, social justice, and ecosystem science uh, research and practice. In history, we've seen urban planning and public health as being intertwined. Um, remember, it was one of the catalysts for zoning and other planning um, efforts. So let's move toward better integrating um, all of these different disciplines and um, to come up with solutions for cities of the future. Another idea is to increase investments in public spaces that have one or more purposes. So we, um, as Tim said, let's create cities that are beneficial for both people and the environment. Um, we, we want uh, to have a win, 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 win in um, any of these sort of initiatives that we're doing. Lastly, we need to prioritize nature-based solutions equitably. We need to be creative in preventing green uh, gentrification, moving toward just biophilia, and providing um, equitable access to high quality urban nature. So it takes both access, but also the quality of, those, um, of that nature. So with those ideas in mind, um, and certainly Tim nor I have all the answers, uh, we have a few questions that we've been thinking about uh, for the future of flourishing biophilic cities and would encourage you to post uh, any responses you may have to these or any additional questions in the chat. So the first is how will our experiences with nature during the pandemic, for example, uh, increased birding, shape our views of nature longer term? Could this shift provide more support for an even more ambitious future of biophilic cities? How might we continue and enhance the biophilic discoveries and innovations used in cities during the COVID-19 pandemic? What does a post-pandemic biophilic city look like? And lastly, how might technology advance our connection with nature and urban areas? So these are just a few things that we've been thinking about and uh, we welcome your questions or uh, your thoughts and ideas. Well, that was great, Carla. Uh, <clears throat> How do we want to handle uh, questions? Okay, so we have two questions that were text that was uh, written into the chat. Okay. I'll start with them, but before that, actually, I'll start with my own question and then we'll see how it goes. So I would like one of you or both of you to talk a little more about how we can actually ensure biophilia does not contribute to gentrification. What are some of the strategies that you've seen or you've, you've come up with? So that's the first question. Okay. My second question is about biophilic buildings. So I've seen some of them. Actually, the one that comes to, my, to mind is Bosco Verticale in Milan. Mm -hmm. Beautiful building. So, but one of the things that came to my mind because I have background in architecture, A, it's very expensive to maintain that kind of building. And second, is this type of, is this available to people of lower income? Um, it's, it's an access issue. Yes, it's great. It does wonderful things to help, but it seems only a few people have access to it. And the third thing is, are our construction and building materials ready to handle biophilic buildings? So if you can answer all of these together, uh, however you want to answer them, and then we can move on to the questions uh, people sent. I'll let you go first, Tim. Okay, well, um, first of all, I, I realize I, I didn't, I'm not clear about how much time we have. Um, when does the class end? You've got, a, we've got a half an hour maybe or so? We have half an hour, but uh, if you wanted to stay and if there are people who want to stay and ask questions, so. Okay, we'll yeah, and I don't know, Carla, I'm, I'm happy to stay uh, for as long as folks wanna, wanna talk, but uh, yeah, those are wonderful questions. So I'll start, um, yeah, so we, as Carla mentioned, there's even you know language now that we use like eco gentrification or green gentrification. I think if we were to sort of pull uh, our 25 
partner cities, um, th that would be a, a really important, a consistent concern. And, uh, and so what, what can you do about it? And I mean, there, there, there are folks, Carly mentioned just green enough. There's a, a um, there've been people who basically argue, we don't wanna, we want to invest in nature in neighborhoods uh, that will improve the quality of, of life for those people, but we don't want to invest too much or gentrification will, will, will happen and, and, and displacement will occur and you know, all, all of that. So there's some kind of a sweet spot there. And I, I must say, I, I have some objections to that as a vision. Um, and uh, I think we we do believe that nature is a birthright. Everyone is entitled to it. I, I don't think we wanna to aspire to just green enough. So um, I think we have to figure out how, how to invest in nature. One, one answer is that as we begin to do what Richmond is doing and other cities are doing and we and we equalize that distribution of nature, some of those effects, um, those displacement effects may, may diminish. Um, but we have some wonderful examples. Um, Washington DC is in our, our network and um, I'm frequently talking about the 11th Street Bridge Park uh, there, which is a project, uh, a park, a wonderful, very creative park that isn't even built yet. Um, and even before it's built, they have engaged the neighborhoods around it um, they have prepared a, an equitable development plan, actually, to, to, to make sure that, that uh, folks in the neighborhoods around it benefit from the employment that it generates. They've created a, a community land trust as part of a comprehensive effort to, to, to protect the affordable, affordable housing in the, in the neighborhood. Um, it's a comprehensive strategy. So that's the, those are the kinds of things that we need to do. Um, and so we've got to be thinking about those potential unintended consequences ahead of time, right? So um, there are other models. Uh, we have a film about a, a park uh, called Cully Park in Portland, which is a, a wonderful example of an alternative way of, of developing a designing and developing a park in an underserved neighborhood in that, in that city where it isn't just the the parks department on high sort of deciding, you know, what, what this park will look like and feel like and function like it's giving the, the neighborhood um, that ability actually to own it and to craft it. And so you've got the kids from the neighborhood designing the, the raised bed gardens for it's a community, one part, part of it is a community garden. This is another, actually a, another film, another seven or eight minute film that we have on the web, the web page. So, I, it's it's a really important uh, question. I don't think we fully ha have the answer, um, but our cities are are struggling with it, working hard. Uh, as a planner, I feel like we we often don't have all the tools that we need um, to to fully address it, and I, I think that's uh, part of what we need to work on in in the future. Carla, you want to chime in? Um, I was just going to mention that our partner cities, as Tim uh, said, are very dedicated to this issue. And we've just launched a series of working groups where our partner cities are uh, working together to come up with some strategies for these. And we have one on just biophilia to kind of think about how yes. um, and, and come up with- mention the working groups, yeah. Yeah, some innovative um, ways that we might be able to overcome this because it's certainly a challenge. Obviously, I live in Atlanta, uh, Georgia, and have seen the impact of the Beltline on um, much of the city and, and a lot of the strategies that are put into place, were put into place to promote affordable housing and people staying in place were unable to sort of take place um, in reality. But um, I think coming up with with um, different uh, strategies to test out uh, some of these ways, I think is, um, it's, a, it's hopefully it's something that will come from our work, working. Yeah. Groups. And so your other questions are wonderful as well. Um, and so Bosco Verticale has certainly gotten lots of uh, criticism and critique uh, for a lot of reasons and some wonder uh, about, you know, is that real nature? Is that a cosmetic, you know, um, kind of nature? Will it function? Will it provide important, important ecosystem functions? And and it turns out, on some measures, it's it's it does. For example, birds uh, actually surprisingly well for birds. 
Uh, not perfect, not a perfect story. That um, Designers Walk project in Toronto, but it, you raise a good a good question. That Designers Walk is um, fa fairly high end residential housing, and the and the the designer and the developer will say yes, that's that's true. And uh, but we're hoping that this plug and play uh, tree system, they're they're vastly improving on the design of Bosco Verticale actually will uh, be be more universally applied in a whole variety of different kinds of, of housing. We, we do actually have wonderful examples of biophilic design principles that are applied in, in um, more affordable housing uh, and social housing projects like Via Verde, for example, in the Bronx and in New York. That's a case study that we've uh, been uh, working on and monitoring and following for for a, another, a number of years, Jonathan Rowe's uh, uh, project, uh, actually multiple levels of forest, uh, a for an orchard on one level, uh, an evergreen forest on one level, um, food, food producing gardens on one, one level. And it's, uh, it's, it's essentially um, um, low income and, for and affordable units, some market units, but m mostly affordable. So it's not a crazy idea that these that these uh, design elements uh, uh, could could not only be incorporated into into more affordable housing, they could help to make that housing uh, uh, more livable and more affordable and and healthier. Actually, the Via Verde project is has a strong uh, emphasis on health. Actually, so um, your other question was building material, um, and that I'd love to have a conversation about more specifically what you have in mind there. Um, I mean, I think we have various, the various levels of development, you know, various kinds of material that we have. I, I don't think that we, if, if looking at some of the WOHA projects, for example, um, a lot of things off the shelf now, and I, I feel like we don't, maybe the Habitech, Habitecture slide that I showed, there's still a lot of R and D and a, and a and a lot of testing and uh, um, you know work that needs to be done there. But I I, I feel like that uh, the the, the um, many of the the design technologies like green walls and green rooftops that were um, more experimental 20, 30 years ago, uh, they weren't. They were you know fairly standard practice in parts of Europe, but experimental for American cities have now become part of the norm. So a city like Washington, D.C., um, you know, literally hundreds of green roofs and, and um, some and, and that's a, a kind of mainstreaming of many of these biophilic design ideas that we're seeing a, across the country, across the world, for that matter. So I don't know if that that's at least partially answering some of, some of that. Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Um, and can we I'd love to hear people's voices if they feel inclined to speak up, Are, <laughs> is that putting them on the spot? Uh, so it's a little more conversational if we. If so what we can do is the people who already asked ask their questions. So those who asked, who typed in their question, mm. I will unmute them. They have to repeat it. They have to stay. <laughs> they, they, they can ask it in their own words. Okay. So what I'll do is, uh, I think the first person who asked was um, Gerald Phillip. Um, Gerald, hello there. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay. <laughs> Putting her on the spot. Okay, hey, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a great session. Um, I happened to be listening to NPR's TED Radio Hour this week, and the focus was on flooding and resiliency, which is an area I'm spending a lot of time working in. But featured was a Hindi festival where an entire city is constructed temporarily to provide everything that millions of people who come to the festival need for 60 to 90 days, including infrastructure and housing, and at the height of the monsoon season. It's removed yeah. after the festival and only biodegradable mats remain that wash into the river. It was used as an example for, well, it was suggested that this type of design could be used as an example for how future Olympic villages could be constructed and not leave a lasting footprint. And this seems like a temporal biophilic city concept. I was wondering if you had heard of this and if you had any thoughts on biophilia and temporal cities. Hmm. Wow. Carla, <laughs> you want to start? Take a... 
We, by the way, have only we have one Indian city, Vishakhapatnam, um, who, and we're very excited that they're now in the network. Um, but we hope to have many, many more. But, but go ahead, Carla. No, I, I um, that I think is a terrific point and something that we uh, should be thinking more about. I'd love to hear Tim's thoughts. Yeah, you know, um, I don't know that we have anybody in the network that's quite doing that. Um, I, I know a little bit about this story. It, it certainly is part of the larger trend of, of um, you know, building things in ways that either can be disassembled uh, and reassembled somewhere else or moved. You know, my own background in coastal uh, planning, you know, years ago, we have, we, have, we have programs like the New York State Coastal Management Program that had, you know, had been designating zones for only movable structures. Um, so the idea of being, of being able to pick up your house you only get to put it there if it's possible for you to pick it up and move it later. Um, and, and a lot of uh, folks in the design world, Bill McDonough, for example, who's been working, continues to work on this idea of a, of a framed, a framing system that you, you assemble for one function and then you take it apart and, and reuse it again. It's part of, it's part of his idea of cradle to cradle. Um, so I think there's a lot of promise in that in that notion and um, the whole, you know, idea of a of a city that's that's constantly moving and changing and and um, it it pulls in the idea of pop up parks and and uh, we have a lot actually a, a fair amount of um, work in cities like San Francisco, you know, where they're they are you know they're they're creating um, little pop up places that end up you know being permanent parks often but but the, there is a temporal a really important temporal dimension to cities generally right and why don't we figure out how to tap into that and uh, and create gentler kinder development patterns and safer ones and ones that do you know respond to the things you're interested in and and, and um, have, have little to no impact on that river for example, or that water, that water body. So it's a great, uh, a great idea, and um, we'll have to, I'll have to do some more pondering about, and maybe some better examples from some of our, from some of our network cities. It's a great, great idea. By the way, Gerald is one of my students. This is how, this is how, um, not that you look old, but rather years just ago. making, making me feel years old. Ago. Right, exactly. So, so um, yeah. Anyway. Thank you. I also. Um, so, so Gerald, yes. Gerald, do you mind if I go through the other questions then, and you can come back and ask uh, your second question? Sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, Katie Grayson, would you like to, um, first of all, um, Carla, do you mind um, stop, can you stop sharing so we can see everybody? Thank you. Oh, so good, yeah. Okay, great. Katie Grayson, um, I would like to unmute you, but I can't see you on my screen. Uh, hmm. Can you raise your hand so that way? Oh yeah, I found you, okay. Hello, okay. hi. Um, I'm not gonna turn my video on because my lighting is a little bit strange. It's kind of dark in here, um, but I had a little bit more of a specific question. Um, you mentioned something about the RVA master plan and how 100% of residents were gonna live 10 minutes away from a park. And I was wondering if that was 10 minutes walking or driving. It's a ten-minute walk. So oh, this, awesome. this is a this is a standard becoming a standard metric in cities around the country, and partly because of the trust trust for public land has had a ten-minute walk uh, campaign. Um, it sounds great. Um, I, I, actually, what we're what we're promoting is you know more more like a one-minute walk or a thirty-second walk. I mean, Carla may disagree with me here, uh, but a lot a lot of cities actually you know in Seattle. 90 something percent is within a 10 minute walk. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, it, it, we don't rest on our laurels there. And um, a, a, even a 10 minute walk, uh, if you're eight years old or 88 years old uh, is a significant thing. So actually we've just, just written a story about a wonderful initiative in Philadelphia called um, Park in a Truck. And there's a landscape architect, Kim, um, uh, Kim Douglas, 
who's come up with this idea. And, and it's basically, um, you know, what, what, how, how can we quickly and, and at relatively low cost convert um, vacant lots? And in, in Philadelphia has 40,000 vacant lots. It's a huge potential for creating uh, little parks in, on every street. And, and, there, and the outcome is, is really uh, quite, quite striking. So I'm not, ten, yes, 10 minute, that's a great threshold, but it's not even ambitious enough, I think. Okay, great. Um, iPhone, no name, it says iPhone has commented and suggested, recommended a book. It's called Invention Nature. So uh, there's an Amazon link for anyone interested. So we'll go to the next question uh, by Aaron. Um, how does biomimicry in architecture, well, oh, sorry, um, Aaron, you can ask it yourself. So I'll find you on the screen. Um, I can't see Aaron. Can um, I, think I'm, I think I'm unmuted. Hi there. Um, hi there. Hi, hi, I was wondering how um, the biomimicry within architecture, how that plays in. I don't think that's necessarily biological the way that biophilia is. And also with regards to cost and working with, you know, if not cities themselves, sort of private developers, you know, what kind of, when you do get resistance, what it, what's the basis of the resistance? Mm. So two questions, sort of. Yeah, uh, good ones. Carla, do you wanna, you wanna start? Or? I would say the biggest um, uh, resistance we get when we're um, advocating for, for biophilic cities is, is usually cost. So, um, but we have, um, there are a lot of, uh, there's a yeah. lot of research uh, explaining the economics behind biophilia and how it's, it's can be cost saving in other ways um, and has a, uh, quite a, a short payback period. I don't know if Tim wants to yeah. talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think that's the, definitely, it, it comes up. It comes up a, a lot less frequently in questions than it, than it used to. Um, and I'm not even sure I would put it as, as number one any, anymore, but what, what ha what's happening, of course, is that uh, many of these projects are uh, proving, proving to be wildly popular and, and highly uh, profitable. So um, the example I showed of, of the um, Park Royal Hotel in, in Singapore, WOHA uh, project, it, it, uh, when it, opens, it, it opened its doors, um, it, it was able, the hotel was able to almost overnight double their room rates. So many people wanted to be in that hotel uh, because of its uh, biophilic elements. And it's really a wonderful experience. You, I mean, you feel like it, it's, a, it's a hotel in a garden. That's what they call it. Um, now, that's not necessarily a good thing, right? We don't, we don't want to raise the cost of, of everything and the, certainly the cost of hotel rooms or the cost of, of housing. But um, it made it really easy or relatively easy for the architects to, to um, sell those ideas to, to the client. And I mean, that's, that's a consistent story that we hear. Um, and so, and as Carl is saying, many of the, the things that we argue for or advocate for have a, have a really quick, almost an immediate payback period, right? Um, and uh, the arguments are a little bit different when you're, when you're talking to a mayor, but the payback period, the payback to uh, re the return on investment, for example, of planting trees, um, and you can talk about it in, in, in terms of all many of the health outcomes that Carla mentioned, or life expectancy. You start talking about life expectancy, that gets that, you know, uh, it's pretty compelling, and uh, and so it overcomes a lot of those those uh, that resistance in terms of of upfront costs con connected with things. Um, your question about bio biomimicry, lots of uh, uh, over overlap there, a lot of harmony, um, and in this biophilic cities initial biophilic cities book, um, there are sections about bio biomimicry and and so some of the um, you know best examples of biophilic design, biophilic buildings also have bio, biomimicry elements to them. They certainly have, they certainly have a, lot of, a lot of design work that's inspired by nature. Um, and, and, um, and we've gotten to know Janine Benyes pretty well and the, you know, all, the, all the wonderful work going on by that group. Um, and, 
and we, we we join forces where where we can and and um, we you know where we can design a a, um, a a living wall that also you know functions like an actual wetland and 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 cleanses and treats uh, stormwater or gray water for that matter um, that building be becomes you know we're we're modeling a natural system in a, in the same way that the biomimicry folks are are uh, advocating for so so there's a lot of a lot of harmony a lot of parallel between these movements i would say um was that your qu your question i guess it's a longer conversation about our our longer list of obstacles i mean sometimes for me the the bigger obstacles these days are lack of imagination maybe uh failure to fully in, envision what would what's possible in a neighborhood or a city. Um, sometimes it's about the existing code and the existing you know um, laws that get in the way of doing things that you really want to do and everybody wants to do. We have a we have a colleague Nina Marie Lister in Toronto who who um, deci decided to convert her yard into a, a native you know. Uh, pollinator garden, a native plants garden, which what, what we want everybody to do. Um, but it turns out there's a tall grass and weeds bylaw in Toronto. And so she was in violation of the law. Uh, I mean, it's just crazy in a city that has a biodiversity strategy and, and you know, uh, that's sometimes a problem, um, those kinds of things. Um, so anyway, there's a longer conversation about but, in, but increasingly, I think the, the cost issue, um, there, there is the, the maintenance and, and the question actually, um, uh, Matoch, you, you asked, I think, um, that, that often comes up as well. You've got all this wonderful green, these green elements in the building, who waters them, who cares for them, who, you know, who's responsible for them, and that, that's a, that's a, that can be an obstacle. Okay, our next asker is Gabriel. Um, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, um, Hi my name is Gabrielle Davis. I'm currently a senior at Rowan University in New Jersey, and I'm writing my senior term paper on biophilic urbanism. And some doing some research I found, I was increasingly interested in children and their exposure to nature and how important it is and their cognitive and physical development and how nature deficit disorder is now a really huge problem. Um, mm. And I was reading this study in Australia, how it was saying how children's exposure to nature is now being limited more to their front yards because the world is becoming progressively more and more unsafe. And cities more recently have been viewed as being unsafe places. But as we saw in this presentation, biophilic urbanism can decrease crime rates in cities, right? right. So how do we put more of our focus on making our private property um, greener, more biophilic, or are we gonna transform cities into this new kind of safe haven so children can get out and play and even socialize more than they would? Especially now because of COVID children in school, I worry like they're missing out on really important years of social development. Um, yeah. So how do you handle that? Or what are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Carla, do you wanna start or? I say both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think it's a, you don't want to choose necessarily, but yeah, I mean, well, go ahead, you, you, you start and I'll chime in. No, I was just going to say our, our cities have, um, I think, had a really nice balance between the two. I'm thinking of St. Louis, Tim, and mm. the Milkweeds for Monarchs mm -hmm. and how they um, were encouraging private um, or just residents to plant milkweeds um, yeah. on their property um, and how that actually um, sparked uh, such a great interest in the monarch uh, sort of population there. And so that's one initiative of where the cities have been yeah. promoting private, uh, private property owners, or even I think renters could participate in the program um, to sort of enhance um, and connect with nature within yeah. their property, but connected to uh, the larger community. Um, I, I would also say just that, um, you know, we are looking at this from a, a global scale in cities across 
the globe. And so wanting to think of this more holistically um, too than just individual sort of parcels of land, but sort of how they all um, connect. So that's how I came up with the both answer. We, we yeah. were kind of working in both directions. No, it's a good answer. Uh, and from, from the perspective, as Carla suggests, of, of creating, moving us in the direction of a biodiverse uh, city, those private spaces are, are really going to be important. And the, the, um, from a bird perspective, for example, we, we really want every front yard, backyard, we might want all those spaces to be bird habitat. Um, and, and they can deliver a lot of benefits. Um, as Nina Marie Lister in Toronto talks about, I've got bird song from my whole neighborhood. And, um, but at the same time, what you're suggesting is right, that, that we, we want a, a safe, uh, child-friendly, walkable, you know, sort of uh, city. We want we want a, a city where there can be um, free-range kids, right? Or, or as my friend Peter Newman says, feral kids. Free-range isn't isn't good enough. We want feral kids, and they ought to be able to, you know, wander around and and do do all the things I I did as a kid. This is what Rich Louv, you know, talked so much uh, about, and and we have you know wonderful examples of of, of progress. In that way, you mentioned the the fact that you know we have evidence now. We know uh, this evidence. The studies from Philadelphia: when you plant trees on vacant lots, the neighborhood becomes safer. So investing in 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 nature uh, is 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 going to lead. It's not the only answer, and it can't be the only thing, but it will lead. It will help to lead to safer neighborhoods where kids can 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 spend time. Um, another part of this, uh, by the way, I don't know if you know about the Children in Nature uh, Network, which Rich, Rich Louv started, but um, it's a wonderful resource and it's, they have a big annual conference and they have, you know, it's a whole bunch of people. Uh, we intersect a little bit with them and um, Rich Louv is on our board and he's, he founded this network and his, he has a special interest in, in kids. So we, we um, have a lot of stories around schools, uh, which would be interesting to you, I think. So another film that we have on our film page is a, the uh, Ch 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 Chattahoochee Hills Charter School just outside Atlanta. Carla's laughing at my, my uh, stumbling on the word, but this is her backyard. But uh, um, it's a wonderful story. It's a, again, seven or eight minute film about this charter school designed um, for kids to be outside and it's not one building it's five different buildings all the, the kids come with their boots and their coats and and their their day is about you know time outside and they take their math assignment out to the forest and they so we interviewed these kids um and they told us things like they you know several of them want to be farmers when they grow up you almost never hear this you know from little kids um, and it's partly because they are growing food and it's, an, it's a farm, actually. That's part of what they're modeling at this. So I think, you know, we got to rethink all those kind of ways that we're doing the way, you know, the early exposure and the way we're teaching kids. And every school, this is what's happening in Paris and a lot of other places, schools are being converted in, into, into nature hubs, you know, into, um, and, and that's a really good trend. Um, and what will help to make that neighborhood and that city more uh, child-friendly and, and safe. So good points. Uh, next is Hope. You can unmute yourself. Um, hi, uh, yeah, I'm Hope. Hi. Um, I asked a question about um, like lead building certification and if that was like something that was like pushed like for the cities that have joined like the programs um, or if it was like something that they like kind of chose to do on their own. Yeah, um, it's not something that we push. Um, I mean, we certainly recognize that lead certification is a good thing and there are certainly implications for greening buildings, you know, and you get points for things like green, green roofs and green walls. So it's good. Um, I'm actually a bigger fan of the Living Building Challenge. I don't know if you know about that one, but it's a, it's a much stronger standard and uh, buildings have to, like the, the um, Phipps Conservatory Center for Sustainable Landscapes is a is a living building certified certified li living building um, and 
if you look at our film, I feel like I'm promoting all our films. I am. Um, it'll talk talk about that, but it's it is it has to produce as much energy as it needs. It is so um, net zero energy, net zero water, um, and you know it's a it's a very rigorous standard um, that requires you, that you demonstrate performance over time. Those are all really good things, but again, um, we're not a certification group, so. So to join the Bioflex Cities network is an aspirational network, and we don't want to be certifying that you're a biophilic or not. That's not what we're about doing. So um, yes, uh, green buildings tend to be part of the package of things that most of our cities are are pursuing, um, and they're you know, and again, it helps us move that biophilic agenda forward. But it, as I started with. You know, a biophilic city is more than just biophilic buildings. Um, so, so it certainly is helpful um, to, to have more uh, a sustainable buildings. LEED certified is certainly helpful. But, it, but to answer your question, that's something that the cities would do on their own. It's not, it's not part of our, again, part of our, it's not a requirement for us. I was just going to add that I think what's really great um, about the cities within our network is that we work with each one of them individually to come up with their own indicators for success. Since, um, as Tim mentioned, some are maybe in a more aspirational state where others might be refining uh, certain initiatives and policies that they have that um, we really tailor it to where we, we, we encourage them to dream uh, big and aspire to be more biophilic in any, uh, in every way. And um, so that's, that's part of, I think, what, what we're really emphasizing is this idea of everyone starting in, in different places and having different goals. The goals of uh, Phoenix, Arizona are not going to be the same as Wellington, New Zealand, and that, that we can't uh, measure them by the same indicators. Okay, great. Our next asker is Alex Newton. You can unmute yourself. I don't see where Alex is. Yeah, I can't see Alex either. Alex may, may have left. We may have scared them away, uh -huh. you know, telling, asking them to... to <laughs> it's one thing to type your question in the chat box, but then you have to... There we are. Okay, sorry about oh, that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so I'm a freshman at Virginia Tech currently. I'm taking a creating an ecological cities course. And I know that you mentioned earlier that when you have buildings that have like internal greenery and forests built into them that, you know, someone has to be there to take care of them. So I was wondering like, how are jobs, like what is the percentage of new jobs created when you're doing this, not only in like constructing the city, but in maintaining it as well? Wow. Um, I, I don't know, Carla, that we have great any question. particular, yes, yeah, a great question. We don't have any uh, particular data or numbers to, uh, but I, I think that that, I think you can definitely, I would validate the premise of your question. It's, um, you know, and it ties into all of the stuff right now, the kind of pandemic, the, you know, the, um, one of our cities, Austin, Texas is creating a climate core um, you know, kind of employment and kind of a um, civilian conservation corps style um, employment program to, to do a lot of things, a lot of biophilic planning kinds of things like plant trees. Um, and I think that this is Green New Deal, right? It's all stuff we've been talking about for, for months. I do, I do think there's a, a huge, potentially a huge employment benefit connected to all of the things we've been talking about um, tonight. And uh, and groups like um, Major Majora Carter's, you know, founded the um, um, Sustainable Bronx, and part of that, and, and other organizations that are, are models for this too. But the idea of uh, training uh, people living in that neighborhood in in the skill set uh, of you know being an arborist or being a, a, a designer. And uh, an installer of, of green roofs, for example, there is a huge, huge benefit, employment benefit. You're asking about maintenance specifically, though, I guess, and that's that's uh, certainly a part of it. Um, 
you know, ideally we, we, we increasingly want e ecological building systems that are sort of self-maintaining, right? That don't require you to, to go in and change out a lot of plants and do, do a lot of that. We're not quite there, um, but um, we, do, we do see systems, th these um, new green walls that allow you to move the green wall and replace one plant rather than you know, the whole thing. Um, there, there are there are ways of you know in a way we're kind of there's a tension there. We want employment, but we also we want to minimize the you know the, the need for constant maintenance of, of green elements. But you raise a good you raise a good uh, question. I think. Great. Thank you so much. I have muted myself. Okay. Uh, so now, these are all the questions that were typed in. Uh, Gerald had a question and a few comments, so mm. I'll just yeah give you a chance to ask the question okay. and share the comments. Sorry about that. Um, not, not really a question, but I think a, another great example of a biophilic city concept. Um, mm. New York City is doing some phenomenal stuff with their parks system and building it out and um, just encouraging anybody who gets to New York to walk along the High Line. That is just a wonderful synergy of nature and architecture and getting people out walking through the city, through the buildings, but you're outside. And volunteers are employed to Take care of that space along the way. It, it's an old elevated railway that's um, been preserved and uh, a walkway has been placed along it and people just hang out or they walk along. It's completely free and it connects to other green spaces in the city. So check it out next time you're in New York and also in Virginia Beach, the Brock Environmental Center, um, I believe is a winner of the Living uh, Building Challenge. Um, thanks. Yeah. We have one question uh, from, okay. We have one hand up, I see, Marcel. Yeah. And then I, I missed, uh, I can't see it anymore. Oh, yes. Okay. I have unmuted you, Marcel. All right, perfect. Yeah, I loved your guys' presentation today. Uh, what I was going to add on top of that New York thing is uh, I would really look into Teardrop Park uh, by Michael Van Valkenburg. That's like one of the best like naturalistic play environment. It's right by the 9-11 uh, Old Trade Center. And it's it's a beautiful site and very similar to what Gerald was saying is awesome. Yeah, a actually it's a it's a wonderful example uh, of designing a, a park, a wild park for kids too, because it's um, it's got these, you know, dramatic slides and things that are little hills and things that were designed to, to give it diversity. And actually, Robin Moore, I don't know if you know that name, but uh, at NC State, who is probably the, the, the premier landscape design for kids uh, guy in school, school design, he, he was uh, involved in that, in that design. So it's a wonderful example. New York has so many really great examples of things. Um, and uh, so there's so much to to, to see and experience there, definitely. But, uh, but the, the, yeah, that's Battery Park and, and this, this little park, right? Sandwiched wild park in the, in the middle of basically high rise buildings all around it. It's really quite, I think, quite spectacular. Um, so someone asked, can you write down the name of that park? Teardrop Park. Um, and if you just Google that, I think you'll find you'll find a lot of the okay. you'll find a lot about it. Okay, great. Uh, it looks like this is all the questions. These are all the questions we have. Um, if you have final points, Dr. Beatley and Carla, and now we'll uh, and then we could uh, we can end. Um, Carla, you wanna you wanna start? All right, I can start, and I, I'll just say thank you. And and um, it, the, the conversation was fun, and uh, um, would love for you all to be involved in this in some way if you're interested. And that could be uh, 
finding a, a role for you if you want to write an article for a biophilic cities journal or or maybe you are from a city that you think uh, could benefit from being in the network um, let us know um, but uh, and and go you can go to the web page and actually join as an individual you just uh, sign a pledge and and um, then you're uh, part of the listserv and you get all the material and all the all the um, announcements and so on but but yeah we'd love to love for you all to be part of this movement and and find a role um, so and 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 just thank you for inviting us Carl I'll turn it over to you for I agree. Thanks so much for having us. I was uh, typing our email addresses, Tim, oh, in good. the uh, chat and also the link to the website, um, biophiliccities.org. I'll just echo um, that we have so many cities that have joined the network due to individuals committed to yeah. uh, creating change um, and advocating for more natureful um nature opportunities for natural experiences in their city so i encourage you if it's something that you're interested in to um reach out to us we're happy to talk um yep. about biophilic cities anytime uh so please don't hesitate at all great thank you very much um for joining us tonight and for the wonderful presentation and answering all the questions uh, so would like to say good night so um, students you can contact both you have their email and uh, have a, a wonderful night everyone okay thanks so much right. you too you bye later. bye take care I thought that was